Hey everyone, welcome back to Grid Chat. I am your host, Marissa Tandon, and today we are going to be recapping the US Grand Prix, which I unfortunately was not at, which you may have noticed by the fact that Lewis Hamilton had some bad luck, and uh, I personally feel like when I show up, things go better. Um, but today I won't be doing that by myself. I will be doing so with my friend, Lindsay, who you have heard on the podcast before. Please welcome Lindsay back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I think we are probably the only two creators that didn't find our way to Austin this weekend. Although I know we both were very much tempted to book those last minute plane tickets. <laughs> I know I really had like a like a personal life thing that I was like, oh, I can't miss it. So I was like, you know what? It's fine. I don't need to go. And then what happens? What happens? Lewis Hamilton has like maybe the worst weekend of his life. <laughs> like I yeah. was like, oh, it's my fault. Actually, it feels like my fault. <laughs> Every content creator may have made their way to the US Grand Prix, but one specific cowboy was not present and that's because Daniel Ricardo as much as we had already talked about this because it was a rumor for so long and then it was officially confirmed Daniel Ricardo was replaced by Liam Lawson starting at this race and I think it's a uh, I noticed actually I don't know if, how much you were following everything that was going at the ground going on at the Grand Prix but the CODA official team put up a booth to write letters to Daniel Ricardo and it had like letters to Cowboy Rick was the name of the sign and they had like a place where fans could could sign a book or like write a letter I believe from what I could see online in the videos that it seemed like people were actually like writing letters to Daniel Ricardo to you know say goodbye since he didn't have his proper goodbye and a lot of people felt like Austin would have been the right place to do it especially if anyone listening is a, is a newer fan Daniel Ricardo, despite not being from Texas or America at all have really has adopted Coda as his home race and there have been cowboy boots cowboy hats riding of horses in the in the pit lane uh having a grand old time and so I think him not being there a lot of people were, were pretty it felt like a really specific gut punch for him not to be able to uh, end out at his favorite race this year. We'll talk about all of that. But yeah, I how do you feel about sort of, I, I thought it was interesting. He still had a pop-up. Apparently um, the, uh, the race organizers officially invited him to come and that they would have like had stuff for him to do kind of as sort of like a... If you remember what David Malukas did after he had been dropped, they had him doing sort of like content. It seemed like it would have been the same type of offer for, for Daniel. And I believe Cash App still like did a lot of fun stuff with Daniel Ricardo's pop up since they sponsor him individually. And now uh, we also have the circuit itself kind of getting in on the fun and having, you know, letters to Daniel Ricardo. Also, uh, from what I've seen, it seemed like they did not change any of the posters. So Daniel Ricardo is still on all of the posters when you get into Texas, everything like that. It was interesting to me. I don't know how you feel about it. To me, Coda just doesn't feel the same without Daniel Ricardo. Just I remember him coming into the paddock on that horse. I can't remember if it was last year or two years ago. I must I think it was two years ago. And just being like, this is so perfectly him and just the way he embraces that race is kind of like nothing else I've ever seen with any driver in their home race, let alone a race that is like not even their home race. <laughs> but I think that it just was a little bit of salt in the wound too because of how like bad of terms things ended on with the like not officially announcing that he was leaving before Singapore and that we didn't know officially whether that was his last race or not and I think that is what made it a lot more sour for a lot of fans. Yeah I think I'm so interested to see kind of how people respond to it now that Liam's had a race under his belt which I, I would say spoiler alert, but if you're listening to this, you you watched the race, I would assume. So uh, we'll get into the particulars of it. But Liam really had a great race today. And quite frankly, last year, he when he filled in for Daniel, he really did show his talent. And so when they first announced and the rumors started that Daniel was being replaced, I was bummed to see Daniel go. But I also am not going to pretend like even just on this podcast, I haven't talked about the fact that I thought Daniel was kind of past his prime. And so... It's hard, but I think there's also this sort of feeling, and I think maybe the coda of it all makes it feel a little bit more like crystallized to me as to what the issue is. Formula One teams, as much as we want to feel like everybody's best friends, everyone really cares about each other, they travel the world, they've grown up together, whatever. Formula One teams are a business and Formula One drivers are the highest paid employees in that business, apart from maybe, you know, CEOs and um, Adrian Newey. But I think... <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I, I think it's hard. I, I think the response, right, of like the frustration of Daniel not getting the goodbye that he deserved, quote unquote, really feels like a misunderstanding of the fact that this is not like a family. It's not a friends and family business. It's again, unless you're the Stroll family, then it is a family business, right? But regardless, with Daniel Ricardo in particular, he, I think, I don't know. I felt bummed, obviously, about how it all went down. I felt bummed that he didn't get to say goodbye. I thought he's brought a lot to the sport. I also felt like the year before last, he did get a a proper goodbye to the sport. Everyone knew he didn't have you know, a contract coming back. Nobody expected him to return for the re- the following season. He did finish out. And that path that Daniel chose for himself. So I think so much of the conversation about Daniel leaving and Liam being like his replacement has been about this idea that, you know, Red Bull really screwed Daniel over. They treated him poorly. They didn't give him the goodbye that he deserved. But I also feel like we're leaving out a really big chapter, which is that Daniel left Red Bull in the first place in a pretty audacious fashion. And that was because of the fact that he felt like he was second fiddle. He wasn't getting what he wanted. He didn't want to play second to Max. And that is really what started the downfall of his career. And he he went to Renault. He did the same thing. He sort of came in. He didn't get exactly what he wanted as fast as he wanted it. He got a better offer and he left. He went to McLaren. He was unable to perform and he was dropped. And the thing about that is he did have his goodbye. He, like he there He did leave and he was done. And that was really the consequences of the choices that he made for his own career. And obviously everybody's going to make a choice that wants them like that they believe they could be on top. Right. So like Daniel's not going to make a choice to stay at Red Bull. If he thinks he's never going to be prioritized again, he's never going to win another championship. They're always going to ask him to move out of the way for Max. I can see why he would leave. And I'm not saying that any of those were bad decisions, but I think it's a little like, I think sometimes it's a little short, not short sighted, but short like remembrance, I guess this idea that like Red Bull did something so terrible to Daniel when Red Bull really gave Daniel a second chance that objectively he didn't necessarily earn from them with the way that he left and so I think that's the part that it's like a little hard for me to be as out- outraged as everyone seems to be um over it and I would have loved for him to be at Coda and I think it could have been really fun but there seems to be this like collective mourning which I totally get I totally get that we're sad that this really awesome figure of Formula One that also is responsible for a lot of the shift in fandom and in sort of the demographics of making people feel comfortable in Formula One and a very large kind of um, growth in female fans as well. Like Daniel Ricciardo has a figurehead that has ushered in a new generation of fans to Formula One. And I think it's totally fine to be sad about the fact that he left. And I'm sad that he's, you know, not there and didn't have any more shenanigans and there were no coda antics. But at the same time, it's like, it's difficult to say that that Red Bull 100% is in the wrong and did this horrible thing to him when it's objectively like he he already left them you already sort of did the reverse yeah I completely agree with all of that and I am the first person to get on social media when things like this happen and remind people that F1 is a business (laughs) because I think (laughs) that a lot of people like have a tendency to take these driver moves very personally and I guess it wasn't like I of course also was disappointed that he got dropped I remember watching Drive to Survive as how I got into the sport and like he is what draws people into Drive to Survive and like he is what drew me into Drive to Survive and kept me from finishing season one to wanting to watch season two and then you continue to at least for me I continue to develop like support for and fandoms of all of the other drivers and teams from there but everything about it was just weird. Like I completely agree. They Mm. don't owe, Red Bull doesn't owe Daniel everything, anything. It was just weird. And it still is weird because we have a bunch of different stories still coming out. People are saying that they knew beforehand and that Daniel knew and Daniel didn't want to make a big deal about it. But then you have other people within V-Carb and Red Bull saying, no, like, it was our decision that we didn't let Daniel have like this, like big hurrah goodbye. So that is what I don't understand is that why is this all just so shady? Like, I don't understand why Red Bull has never hesitated to make a cutthroat decision in their past. So why are they being weird and kind of dancing around it now? Yeah. Something I do wonder about that is like the, 
Um, one of the things I did want to talk about in this conversation is that the, like, I believe his title is head of partnerships or something along those lines. He works for marketing and, and relationships with uh, cash app. And during all of the drama before Daniel was like officially announced as not coming back, um, he went on his Instagram stories and was pretty emotional and was like, I don't know what's going on. They haven't told us anything. If this is his last race, I think that really sucks. And that's a problem for us. And, and sort of implying like the reason why cash app sponsors VCARB is because of Daniel Ricardo and, you know, cash app is, is associated with visa. There's, there's a lot of money in that relationship as well. And if it's, I don't, I don't know that it's possible that Cash App as a whole had no idea that Daniel was leaving, but obviously this uh, kind of higher up person who works directly with the team and works directly with Daniel Ricardo um, was not alerted. And I think there's like a frustration in that too, where there's so much conversation. And I do wonder if part of that is like some of what you're saying about Daniel Ricardo being this big figure of being the in for a lot of people from drive to survive or from you know different elements of of how much he has been involved with fan engagement yeah i think when you look at it and it's like okay last year up until when he came in and took over for nick he was essentially just a marketing piece that was the big reason why they brought him back and they kind of gave him something to do and that something to do was getting sponsors to say oh we love red bull we love you know we love people we love working with daniel um and i think that I said previously, I thought that was a large part of why they hadn't made the decision to begin with, that they were trying to figure out how to keep Daniel in terms of the funding and in terms of sponsorship relationships, and also how to bring someone in who's a little bit more capable of scoring points, essentially. And I think that's what a lot of people were struggling with is, like you said, the, the, sh the confusion really is what it is. Like, so many different people are saying so many different things. No one really knows what exactly happened. Did he have a chance to say goodbye? Did he have a chance to do what he wanted to do? And like, to some degree, you know, did he want it to be private? Did he want it to be public? Like, there's so much that you don't know. And there's nothing that all, all we would be doing is guessing. But I do think like, there is clearly a divide of who was let in on the com on the conversation and who wasn't. And I, I personally felt like it, it when they were going into the race, they hadn't made the decision going into the race weekend. And maybe they had post qualifying. And that's why it was such a conversation where he really seemed to know that he was on his way out at that point. And maybe, you know, he sort of had one last shot. Christian Horner has come out and said that Helmut Marco wanted him out back in Barcelona and that you know, Singapore was really something that Christian had fought for. And it's hard to say because we don't know, obviously, and we, we won't. Um, but I think that's kind of what you're saying. That's why it's so frustrating and so kind of murky about why people feel so emotional about it. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up Christian Helmet because I do think at the end of the day, this was more of a Red Bull decision than a V-carb decision, because mm. I think that Red Bull is recognizing that their driver pipe pipeline is kind of struggling at the moment and they have done a really bad job of promoting their young drivers over recent years because they've had people like Checo in the Red Bull seat. They pulled Nick DeVries from Mercedes to fill that second seat last year. Then they brought Daniel back, but they need to test out these young drivers because I think that in a lot of ways, they're not necessarily happy with their number two at Red Bull. So they're looking forward to who's going to fill that seat. And I think they wanted it to be Daniel, but obviously that didn't pan out with his performance on track. So now they are backtracking and trying to figure out what they're going to do. And obviously they think that Liam is one of those options and a better option than Daniel. And I think he showed that today. Yeah. And I think also, um, like you said, they, they do have other younger drivers, which Christian um, did, did kind of touch on. He said, you know, maybe it's not, Liam or Daniel that that we end up having as a second um, driver, which I will say he was not talking about, which I think I've seen a lot of people take out of context. Christian didn't say next year. Like he didn't mean we're booting Checo and we're looking for Max's teammate. He said, obviously we have a contract with Checo for next year, but after that you have to look to the future, right? So just want to put that out there because I've seen a lot of jumps and anything is possible, especially at Red Bull, but at present, that's not the conversation that's being had. But you're right that I think once they focused in on Max, there's like been 
a little bit of a, a loss of that pipeline that they were so strong in for so long. And I think now they do have some some other drivers in their driver academy that they should be looking at. And they've had Liam kind of on the bench for so long that it became to the point where it was a contract issue, where we've seen them basically say that the reason it had to be done at this point in a way that everybody was unhappy with is because of the fact that there was something in his contract that said this was the day that we had to make a decision by. Um, and they've kind of put themselves in a situation where there are all these, always these like ticking time clocks of, okay, well, Daniel has to prove that he deserves this seat by this date because Liam is going to be kind of locked out. And we don't know if there was a con- consideration of how much data Liam would have had for how much time he spent with Red Bull and how that could have helped another team. And Red Bull has lost another number of kind of key staff members to competitive teams for next year as well. Um, not to mention Adrian Newey, which is a whole other situation. And so I think there's this balance of Red Bull had so much talent, but we've also seen them go through so much talent so quickly in recent years. They had Alex Albon, they had Pierre Gasly, they have now gone through um, Nick DeVries, who they had brought over from Mercedes, like you said, and then we also have Liam that's just been sitting on the sidelines for them to kind of keep the same four driver lineup that they've had for so long. Um, And so with that, it's a question of, you know, when Daniel came back in last year, should that have even been the person that you brought back in? Should they have put Liam in that seat instead of Nick in the first place? And I think maybe that's sort of part of what the problem is, right? Like, okay, we're, when you look back at that decision, and then also Daniel kind of, you know, gets injured and is out, and then you have Liam come in and he proves himself at such a high degree. And then you have the the edit in, in Drive to Survive where you have Liam basically being like, I really feel like I should have gotten to stay and Daniel shouldn't have taken the seat back to begin with. Kind of looking at it now, if you look back there, I sort of am like, yeah, like what would be different if after Daniel, I mean, after they had decided to get rid of Nick, if they had put Liam in that seat, just let him do the, and there had been no Daniel return aside from just like the positivity for Red Bull as a whole and and as an organization for VCARB as a team. I wonder if it not only would have been better for them, but also if it would have been better for Daniel's legacy as well, because then he sort of goes out and he doesn't kind of make this second stint. I don't know. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I do think that definitely would change things. And yeah, I really, I don't have anything else to say. I think that it probably would have been for many fans better if he just had stayed on the sidelines and not made that return because I think that this feels like a much more bitter end than when he left McLaren after 2022. Yeah, I feel like the thing with when he left McLaren in 2022, it felt like, okay, it was a risk that you took and it didn't pay off. Um, and that sucks, but that's just sort of how it, you know it ends sometimes. And we had sort of this like, again, on Drive to Survive, the ending for that season is this like in memoriam cut of how, you know, um, horrendous it is that he's leaving. And, and it's, I remember watching it and being like, oh God, like, this is quite hilarious to me that we're, I was like, I don't, I mean, I I don't think they kill you after you lose your seat in Formula One. I'm pretty sure you just get to retire, (laughs) but it seems like he may not be coming back ever again. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and so like you have it was this dramatic moment but also it was like everyone seems to be upset about now like a proper goodbye and it now it feels more like you got your second shot and you really proved that you don't have it anymore and that i think is partially why people are so are feeling so much more upset and also why it feels so much more bittersweet um because he did have a proper big goodbye and then he kind of brought himself back and coming back he he just like he said he himself said he just was spending so much time fighting for 10th um and not really getting there and that's i don't know it's a bummer sometimes i feel like you got to know when to it's it's the same in any sport right like you either finish a, as a legend like you do you pull a michael jordan you win every championship that you can six of them back to back and then you're like all right that's it i'm out of here um or you keep playing and you're a LeBron James uh, where you kind of now the question is like, okay, well, you've been to the finals 
a lot of times, buddy, and you're continuing to not win. You're continuing to choke. Now you're the oldest dude. And, you know, you have, whether or not this is true, you have the question of like a tainted legacy where the longer you stay and the longer you continue to lose, the less the stuff that you did that was good and dominating feels like the less good those things feel. Less impressive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, all of that is to say, I, I know I sounded pretty negative about it, but I am sad Daniel Ricardo's gone. <laughs> was, I missed his presence. I would have written him a letter if I had been at the track. <laughs> I want to be so clear. Please don't cancel me. I'm a fan. <laughs> I, I have like a $135 sweatshirt I bought at Coda last year. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so anyway, my point is I I am in fact... A Daniel Ricardo fan. I'm sad to see him go. To see him go. If I had been presented the opportunity to write a goodbye letter to him, I would have. I also did want to say that I saw a really sweet, like, couple of photos and videos of him facetiming fans in line at his pop up, which I thought was quite. Um, I don't know that I would have been talking to anyone as much as I want to say, like, I would be so great and I would be, you know, there kissing babies, shaking hands. I would be crying in my room and you wouldn't be able to stop me. And I certainly wouldn't be facetiming people, but. Uh, again, his merch is expensive and people were in line for it. So I, I commend the fan service, which is what he's always been good at. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that is at least one thing about his legacy that will go on is just how much he loved his fans. And I think that shows with how much fans loved him in return. Absolutely. Well, let's get into a couple of things prior to talking about the actual racing that I would love to touch on. The big thing right now is that the track was resurfaced at a number of points, which is what caused a lot of the chaos that we had this year. Um, we had slipping, we had sliding, we had forcing people off the track, we had leaving the track and track limits. We had so many issues. And a lot of that is because the resurfacing of the track was intended to work on this major bumpiness that Coda had last year that, that a lot of drivers complained about because it is just, you're just kind of um, you know, bumping up and down, up and down, up and down. And because of the way they sit in these um, seats, it's really difficult on their spine. Basically, you're just sitting and getting kind of hammered all the time. And also, arguably, that bumpiness is part of what may have caused that double DSQ last year with Charles and Lewis Hamilton, which if you did not watch Formula One last year at Coda last year, we had Max winning, but we also had Charles Leclerc and Lewis Hamilton in second and third. And both of their cars were randomly selected for a FIA inspection. And there was a plank that there's a plank underneath the car that has to have only a certain amount of kind of uh loss degradation from the from the race itself and they both they both were over the amount of degradation you can have which led to an automatic disqualification most likely that came from the track being as bumpy as it is and they did not check any of the other cars which is something that they that a lot of people argued they should have done because it seems like for two cars of complete different makes and most likely the ones that won it, it's a little odd that the other cars didn't get tested to see if it was an issue from the track however all that being said that's why we resurfaced and we had a little bit of chaos i was watching practice on friday and i was like did they replace the asphalt with ice like that is how like it was insane to me how much the drivers were just sliding around and it seemed to have improved throughout the weekend but friday was an absolute disaster like i am surprised that there wasn't like a massive <laughs> shunt during the running on friday because there were spins all yeah. around. There were also, I think, from what I understand from people who were there, it was very windy on Friday too. So I think it was a yeah. combination of like slip, slide. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but kind of, I like unpopular opinion, love when stuff like this happens because they race the same tracks every year with, you know, minimal changes from time to time and watching them have to struggle with a new challenge on a track that they think they know so well is kind of fun. Yeah, I completely agree. And I know before leading up to Shanghai, this was like another kind of big discussion because in the time that it had been since they last raced at that track in 2019, they had completely resurfaced it. So everybody was anticipating that it was going to be slick and then 
of course, the drivers hadn't driven there in five years, but I, that didn't cause nearly as much chaos as this Coda resurfacing did. <laughs> yeah, I am a big fan of um, Alex Albon had an amazing spin and catch. Uh, I did. I had in my fully... notes. I was like, hottest <laughs> moment of the weekend. Alex's 360 during <laughs> qualifying. <laughs> that was insane. I was like, hello. There was so many good, you know, that audio that's like, oh, call an ambulance, call an ambulance, but not for me. <laughs> yeah. That one, someone edited it to, to I was, like TikTok his... was just full of those edits. <laughs> it was so good. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, incredible. And then also we have the same with Lewis, like a full, which obviously later uh, it was not an omen for what was to come. But for for practice, he also had a crazy spin um, that he he caught, and I was. It, I love, I think that's part of why I love stuff like this is like getting to see the drivers demonstrate how much control they have over these machines is really cool to me. Um, because watching someone fully spin out and not crash into the wall, but not only not crash into the wall, but like with Alex and with Lewis, I guess too, to just fully snap that right back on and keep going. Oh, Ooh. it was like Beautiful. completely seamless. The like, didn't lose their <laughs> line at all. Like it was insane. It was unreal. Yeah. <laughs> I loved, I loved to see it. So that was amazing. And, but also indicative that we were about to have some chaos. Yeah. We say. <laughs> As we did. <laughs> the big thing that uh, we should kick off with is a uh, half question, half just statement. How do you feel about sprint races? Because sprint race weekends, while they are very exciting, as we know, also mean that you only have one practice session, which, as we said, was a, a spinny one. I like them from a fan perspective. Yeah. I like that you get more meaningful running. I think that the fact that you only get one practice session throws another like twist into things because it really can separate the teams who are like coming to a weekend on top of it versus those mm. who take like those few, those three sessions to like build up to it. It can catch some people out sometimes. And like, I think it may have this weekend with McLaren. So I, I don't know. I like them. I, that might be unpopular because I know they're very controversial, but I'm a fan. I also really like them. I think the only thing I wish is that there was like a way to get a second practice session in, which there really isn't um, Yeah, to continue managing it. But I enjoy them as well because I think you get really fun racing because of a sprint race being half the length of there not being really a pit stop being involved of half the fuel the cars are lighter they're really able to do a lot of fun racing off the bat and I, I know Max specifically has said that it really seems to be like whoever wins the sprint like the sprint race is just like the half version of the race that's coming up it's going to basically be the same and it's not exciting to fans to know what's going to happen but I think this weekend is a great indicator that that's just not the case um it's a really different way of getting to watch the, or it's, I, I mean, it, it's not always the case at least because this weekend we saw Max basically dominate again. Like he, he takes the win. It's a clear win for him and he has some fun racing with Lando, but there's not really a point in the race where you think, oh, you know, Lando's going to get it or anything like that versus the amazing opening that we have on the Grand Prix and how much different that was. And to have a Ferrari one too, you wouldn't have seen that coming from the sprint. Um, and I think also it like heightens the excitement a little bit for the actual Grand Prix because my favorite part of the sprint this weekend was watching the two Ferraris battle it out. Um, though I was like a little tense, I will say. Was like a little, I was like, guys, hey, <laughs> if one of you crashes the other car, I'm gonna lose my mind. Ferraris racing each other, like as a Ferrari fan, I love it and hate it because like I love <laughs> that they can like demonstrate their skill that way. But I also just like am waiting for the Ferrari curse to like kick in and for something bad to happen. And then they're both out of the race. But yeah, I think that maybe one of the biggest things that contributed to the difference in the sprint and the actual race outcome was a qualifying order. I don't know. But I think that as we continue to have this parity that we have at the top, we're going to see more and more instances where the sprint isn't just a carbon copy of the actual race. Maybe that was the case with the sprints we had earlier in the season because Red Bull was still so dominant at that time. But I think things are really just so unpredictable because you have three, sometimes four teams all fighting very closely at the top. So every race is truly different, even within a same weekend. I agree. I think like a really big 
thing that you mentioned there is like parity at the top. The more we have cars that are, we have enough teams right now. We really have three teams that are fully neck and neck with each other in terms of competitive circuits and um, being Ferrari, uh, McLaren and Red Bull, all three of them are bringing really strong cars each week. And Mercedes sometimes shows up to play as well. So sometimes yeah. you really do have like four cars in, in contention, um, meaning eight cars because it's four teams. And that when you have something like that really is there's going to be differences in the sprint and in in the Grand Prix as well. And so I think now that we have kind of gotten out of this era of Red Bull being the winner no matter what and everybody else fighting for second and really before that the same era of Mercedes being the winner no matter what and everyone else fighting for second um as you like you said as you have car as you have parity between these cars at the top like the sprint is exciting because these cars are are really having a fun time driving um and I think also sometimes people talk about this idea that drivers are more hesitant during the sprint because they know they still have to qualify for the Grand Prix after. And I think this sprint in particular, I did not feel that at all. Drivers were here to race. <laughs> no, there was no hesitancy from anybody in that sprint. Like they yeah. were, if they were going to race, they were going to race and go out with a bang if that's what it came down to. Yeah. Also, um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was qualifying order. Um, one thing that they did show was that Lewis was on track to take pole and tell that yellow flag when he had to bail out. And that's another thing that I thought was interesting was the complete difference of Mercedes performance from the sprint to or sprint qualifying, at least to the actual Grand Prix itself. George was so close to taking pole. He had pole until the last second when Max, you know, kind of took that away. And you have George from like qualifying second, you have the Haas cars finishing incredibly well, qualifying incredibly well. Lewis was on track to take that pole position. Uh, had he not had to have bailed out because of the, of the yellow flag, there's like such a difference there because then obviously we know what happens in, in the rest of the weekend for Mercedes. It was quite possibly the worst weekend ever, but I think it's interesting to see that. And also in terms of performance, you see George fall from that second position all the way down to fifth. Um, so Mercedes still has, they, they did bring an upgrade package this weekend and I don't know that we would call it an upgrade from the way the performance seemed to have happened. Yeah. It seemed like neither driver really wanted to have the <laughs> upgraded parts on their car. And I don't know if we want to get into, I do. That, Cause I feel like, yeah, that, <laughs> is like a segue into a spoiler for what happened during qualifying. It definitely is. The one thing I'll say, I do want to just give props where props are due before we move on. And then we definitely should, because that's something I want to talk about for sure. Um, <laughs> I just want to give props to Haas as the only American team on the grid really performing so, so well in the sprint. I was so impressed. And like the entire sprint race, I was like, are they, they're still there? They're still at the top? Are we still, <laughs> we're still going? And it was very exciting to watch them do that. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't think they brought upgrades this weekend, or at least not that I'm aware of, or maybe it was only Nico had the upgrades, but they both did really well. There's just something about being on home turf that energized them, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, they were. I think they're, you know what I mean? I think one of the biggest things is they're sad they lost Chloe Chambers. They're trying to prove, girl pop, you should have stayed with us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't blame her for that decision at all. <laughs> no offense to us. No offense at all. But yes, so let us let us make our our transition here about these Mercedes upgrades package, the Mercedes upgrade package, because as well... To to really, really set the scene, we've got to talk about qualifying and we've got to talk about George because this for, we've got Lewis knocked out in Q1, qualifies 19th. The gasp that I gumped when that happened, I truly thought I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> I really don't understand what just happened. Um, and we I didn't know what to do. It didn't make sense <laughs> at all. I, I was like, literally this is not just real like, life. There's a mistake there on like, the timesheets. <laughs> I was like, um, are we sure? Are we sure that's what's happening? Are we sure though? Like, I feel kind of maybe like we're not sure. Maybe we want to check that. <laughs> and I think also what was frustrating was looking at it. We saw them wait and do like this. They did a scrub tire and then they waited too long. They only got one lap in. And obviously Lewis didn't get the lap that he needed in that one run. And I also was sitting there and I was like, he doesn't have time for another lap. 
what if they just let him do another lap though? What if they were like, well, you know what? You're Lewis. Why don't, <laughs> why don't you take a second one? Why don't you take a second stab at it? Um, the track yeah, evolution it, in that session was also insane as well. Yes. So, and I think that contributed a lot too. Like if your timing was just off, like everybody behind you was going to improve because the track was really just like coming into itself during that yeah. um, Q1 session. Yeah. And I think actually for anybody who doesn't listen, we should talk about what track evolution actually is. If you would like to talk a little bit about that. I mean, anyone who doesn't know what track evolution is, we should talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, it's basically just, there's a lot of variables. It's like the temperature, the amount of rubber that the tires lay down onto the track. And with the fact that there really weren't many support series racing this weekend, the more F1 cars on track, the better it is. And it just took about, I would say, five to 10 minutes of that session for drivers to really start to see the track, like get the right grip and get into those optimal conditions for them to be able to push their laps the way that they wanted to. Yeah. And I think the way that they, Mercedes chose to, and they did this actually with with George too. I can't even say that it was like a, a misstep in strategy for one over the other. It was just that they kept them in for too long. They should have had a second lap and they didn't. So wild, but that was our beginning of that. And then in, in Q3, we have George just send it into the wall. Um, <laughs> fully. <laughs> just fully. Some of the camera angles are of that crash are absolutely insane. Like you just see him like just a blur across yeah. the camera. I was, it's funny now because we know he's like, okay, but I literally was like, hello like what just happened like what just happened like where did this come from and when you watch the replay it really looks like and this is what comes to the upgrades it really looks like he just fully like lost control of the car there's no nobody's on the track in front of him there's no problem there's no debris he just it snaps he spins and that that man is gone he's gone he's it's gone. And that was, I mean, obviously a little wild to watch. It had to have been the upgrade in my opinion, because we then see the same move happen to Lewis during the race, which we know that he maintained his upgrade package because he very graciously offered it to, to, to George. He was like, why don't you take it? I don't want it. Which I thought was funny because George also brought this up in the post-race conference. And he was like, but I would I would never do that. I would never do that to a teammate. And it, to me, just sounded like both of them being like, no, you have the last, last slice of mom's pie that nobody really wanted. Right. I took George being like, I could never do that as like, a, I said, no thanks. I'm good because these <laughs> upgrades are not it. <laughs> I think that was the <laughs> like subtext to George being like, I could never. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the most polite way for them both to be like, I hate it here and I hate this yeah. car and I wish you could set it on fire. Why don't you take them? You take the upgrade package, George. Um, and it was, <laughs> I mean, we clearly saw in the race that not having the upgrades made them far better made a difference made a huge (laughs) difference like you and well and that's why I say like clearly whatever the upgrade package was I would I would say that it's it (laughs) what the version of the upgrades was uh, there's a button that someone can press in the like they gave a button to someone (laughs) in the stands they were like when you press this button one of the Mercedes is going to spin like a top into the wall so you just (laughs) press this whenever you feel like it and that seemed to be the big upgrade button um because we had yeah, it, it was the same corner, the same move, the same spin. Identical, except for so. Lewis saved it from going into the wall. But it would not surprise me in the slightest if these upgrades are non-existent for Mexico. <laughs> because I think that they were like, yeah, maybe we should rethink that. Or if they and if they didn't rethink it, they they don't deserve anything because that's <laughs> they're not using their brains. <laughs> it's like, come on, guys, one. And and that's that's the real crazy part about it is when you look at it and you have George come from he has to start from the pit lane uh, in the race because of how many changes they had to make to the car and how long it took them to to do so to fix it after he he crashed into the wall. You have that and then you have on the flip side, like he goes into the race with no upgrade package, obviously, and makes it all the way back up to six. So for yeah. if if we're debating, hmm, guys, do we think the upgrades worked? I don't think they did. <laughs> It takes a single brain cell to <laughs> look at what happened this weekend and realize that the upgrades do not work. 
truly one me personally i would have ripped them all off before the race started <laughs> i'd have been like look guys i just don't think this is a good idea lewis should have been down there in the garage by himself being like bono we're gonna <laughs> fix this <laughs> I honestly am waiting for the day that some driver, like one of the drivers is caught in, in the garage, like Mission Impossible <laughs> style, removing the upgrades or like changing something. Him and Max, I think, are the most likely culprits that you're like, local Formula One driver found tinkering with <laughs> with vehicle after, <laughs> after hours. I'm ready for it. I would love to see it. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't happened at some point, honestly. Honestly, yeah, I really am. And maybe it has and they just haven't uh, gotten caught. Me, I, I wouldn't get caught if I were going to do it. That's I would be in there. I'd be in there with my own little like, I see underneath the car. I see <laughs> evil mastermind Fernando getting in there and tinkering <laughs> with his car after hours, whether it be in this stint or his previous stint in Formula One before his year-long retirement. <laughs> Yes. Oh gosh. Him and Daniel Ricardo both. We'll be back. Just not right now. That's <laughs> we thought I mean the comeback was almost on last year. Almost, almost. Quite frankly, I do think um it was interesting to watch Fernando. Fernando was a story for me this week because somebody t- called him old. I'm positive somebody made some sort of old joke at him before the race started because he had a chip on his shoulder for Liam Lawson. He was coming for that boy for no reason. He was, he was, I mean, obviously <laughs> perceived reason, like he felt slighted on track, but I just, I don't know if you saw the footage of him confronting Liam in the like yeah. weigh-in after... I was like, hello, you Insane. come at me that hot. We're going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem. <laughs> like that was Which, crazy. And you have like Yuki looking like snapping back to be like, oh that my God. was the like, part that I was like, this is hilarious. <laughs> like I was like, something is yeah. up because Yuki is like, what is going on here? Like you could, t- you could see it. Like it was a grainy video, but you could still see it on Yuki's face. He's like, what on earth is happening right now? Right. And also Liam was asked, like, what did he say to you? And he said, he said that he was going to make life difficult for me. And I was like, that's wild. But like him developing this, like a beef with a kid who's like literally half his age is just like the most, so funny to me. I'm like, Fernando, you are almost 45 years old. This kid is like 22. Like you need to chill. Yes. <laughs> I love Fernando, but it just was so funny. <laughs> so random i just (laughs) to me i was like looking at the incident itself i was like i threatening someone over this is a little wild like that's it was not that big of a deal it was an aggressive racing move yeah it was fine it's like i'm gonna i'm coming for you like whoa bro like i don't know about all that (laughs) i think we should take a minute just do some deep breaths like you are not going to come at me like that. That was too much. And it was it was interesting because I was like, he really held that grudge to the point that I was like, who who made a joke about your gray hair? Like, there's something that you specifically are just unhappy with. And also in the press conference, they, he said it's um he said it's Liam's career on the line, not mine. I was like, whoa, like, it's a lot. And uh, I don't know why he hates him. Maybe he's feeling so he's he personally misses Danny as well he was like I'm gonna I'm writing a letter to cowboy Rick and it's entitled this kid will never be you like (laughs) I don't know Fernando's taking the loss really hard (laughs) It, it felt like it I was like I don't know why else you would be this upset like this is a pretty wild pretty wild situation but what can you do it was completely out of nowhere like it was so random but also just added another layer of entertainment the whole weekend you know what sometimes you're in that kind of mood though you're like i need an enemy i need an enemy for three days <laughs> i'm gonna make it someone else's problem so maybe that's what's going on however the last two highlights from qualifying that i wanted to point out franco out qualifies alex which every weekend i continue to be bummed that franco won't have a seat next year um it feels pretty much like valtteri has the audi seat uh kind of sewn up now at this point um and there was a i guess the statement made that he said he'd reached terms they're just waiting for the final like okay so it seems like he'll be in that seat next year which will wrap everything up um other than obviously liam being confirmed for next year which hasn't happened yet um but i'm bummed i'm bummed that franco's not going to have a spot and watching him in quality quality this weekend and then the race itself i feel like williams had this like 
great driver, similarly to what we were talking about with Red Bull earlier, where they had someone in their driver academy that they had the opportunity to have done something really special with. And instead they went after someone a little bit more splashy and, um, and big names that also really caused a lot of, of PR crises in their attempt to get him. I also love Franco and I'm going to be very disappointed to not have him or seemingly not have him on the grid next year. I had the absolute worst take of all time, like most freezing cold take about Franco when they announced that he was replacing Logan, I was in support of the decision to replace Logan because I was like, I think like, I understand that Williams needs to make some sort of change, but I was like, who is this Franco kid? Why are they replacing Logan with like another rookie? Like he's not going to be able to do any better. Mm. And I, (laughs) that is the worst F1 take I've ever had in my entire life (laughs) because instantly. Yeah. I was going to say, to be fair to you, I think everyone had the same. (laughs) I know, but then, but I have turned into like the biggest Franco stan. Like I am obsessed with that kid. He is like can do no wrong to me now. (laughs) But I'm gonna be so sad to see him go. My highlight of the weekend was also him completely blowing off Martin Brundle in the grid walk, like acting as if he had no idea who Martin was. And Martin was clearly bitter about it because he had to bring it up in the race too. But I was like, this is just another reason why you are an icon, Franco. I love Franco and I can't tell if it's that he knows he's not like there's nothing for him here. Like there's there's nowhere for him to go. I this is my like controversial take. I wish he was in that seat instead of Carlos. I really do. I think I love Carlos. I really have a lot of fun with him. I enjoy watching him race. I think he brings a lot to a team. I'm not saying that it was a bad move for Williams to have done so. I think for Williams as a team, I've always felt like Carlos wasn't the right fit. I think as a teammate for Alex, I I felt like he wasn't the right fit. And I think it's another one of those situations where I think they are setting themselves up for an early season McLaren type of issue where you have two drivers who have been promised this number one spot and feel like they've earned this number one spot and arguably have good arguments for why they should be the the focus driver and that you're going to cause a little bit of that tension. And I think based off of kind of how things have gone before, I feel like the team is not going to make that strong decision and you're going to have a really weird adjustment period versus Franco coming in, bringing money with him. He brought a ton of sponsorship money just for these six races that he's going to be here for. Um, Or sorry, uh, for the nine, I guess it was total that he will have this year. And so I think you have someone who would have come in with money for the team. You have someone who is obviously very personable, has brought a large amount of fan excitement to the team as well. His personality meshes so well with Alex's. They are so funny together. Franco really has a lot of the marketing pieces that Logan was missing, where Logan was sort of afraid to be himself outside of that one little podcast that he was doing with Alex, which now Franco has has returned as the co-host and they're having a lot of fun together. They do great social media together. They're just just very genuinely like a good match I think and it kind of sucks to see to get this preview of what the team could have been and I think they could have spent a lot more money and focus on building the car up and building the team up versus a lot of that money and focus going into Carlos and I think there's just this balance that for the team I think Franco would have been a better fit and it's frustrating that they didn't know that they had this option really it seems like I can kind of see where they were coming from in the sense that he wasn't necessarily, do, I guess you could say, wasn't necessarily doing anything spectacular in F2, but then again, coming in and being like sixth or whatever it was that he was in the F2 championship before he got promoted up to Williams as a rookie mm-hmm. is pretty impressive. And obviously they've seen his simulator data. I feel like James just got distracted by like the, ooh, here's the shiny object in Carlos Sainz. But I kind of share similar concerns that, I think that Carlos is very much going into Williams feeling like it's going to be like his team in a way, like he, like he's Mm -hmm. going in to be like a team leader to be the number one, but I don't necessarily think that that is how Alex feels or even how James and the rest of the team feels about it. Yeah. 
I think and also like knowing Alex's history with Red Bull having gotten dumped from Red Bull in a pretty unceremonious manner and I think it's a hard thing to now feel like someone's coming in to potentially repeat that and to watch the same thing happen to Logan there's got to be a little bit of a unsettling feeling in that space as well yeah but at least on that I don't know if Franco coming in at least makes that any better because in these few races that we've had with him, he's shown that he can be just as good as, if not better than Alex. So I think either way, Alex would be in for a fight next year. For sure. I think he would have been in for a fight, but I think like, I do wonder how he's dealing with sort of like the public perception of the way that James talked about Carlos in this intense enamored way where it was like the most important possible thing. And it was right after they made this big deal of Alex being the future of the team. And now that's obviously, it feels like there's a shift definitely in the sort of public perception of what that means and like how James has been talking about it. And I worry that I think bringing Franco in, it sort of just would have been like, yeah, you have someone to compete with. You have a really strong rookie that no one was expecting to be this good. And all of that being said, like Alex is still the leader of the team to, to some degree. And you sort of would have had that sort of creeping up on you and breathing down your neck for sure, as Franco seems to be very capable of versus a very public, like we've gotten, you know, sort of the diamond of the season. We've picked up the best guy available. Like we win. We, this is such a boon for us. And and it being so much of the news cycle for so long where it feels like you're trying to shift the face of the team and the leader of the team. And obviously, like I said earlier, like this is all business. It's not a family. And if you think you can get a better option, then you can't, then you should do that. And if you think that's going to bring the team up, then that's great. I just worry about the dynamic itself between the drivers and whether or not Williams has the ability to manage it. Yeah, I completely get that. I also kind of see Carlos going into Williams being like with a I'm here for a good time not a long time kind of attitude Mm. like I don't think he sees Williams as necessarily like a long-term thing I think it's more of just like a stepping stone for him until something else that is yeah more worthy not to say that Williams isn't worthy but like more of like a Ferrari or Red Bull or Mercedes or something like that comes back available Yeah, absolutely. And I do wonder if that ever does come back for him, quite frankly, with like so much young talent now. Like we've got the Franco, we have the Franco, we have, we've got Franco, (laughs) (laughs) we've got Franco, we've got Ollie Behrman coming in, we've got Jack Doohan, we've got Liam Lawson, you have these young brand new drivers that are coming in and hitting the ground running. And I wonder when you start to look at things like that, okay, when Lewis Hamilton retires, are you looking to go back to a Carlos or are you looking to bring an Ollie Behrman up that potentially performs really well for Haas? I think that's the question that that he's going to have to contend with. Yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily, I don't see him ever going back to Ferrari because I think that it's pretty clear that Ferrari wants Ollie Behrman to be driving alongside Charles once Lewis retires. And then there is something like a Mercedes, but I don't see them replacing like George Russell to with Carlos Sainz to be paired with Kimi Antonelli because Kimi Antonelli very much seems like the future of Mercedes, but George and Carlos are kind of two sides of the same coin in my eyes, as far as like potential and talent and ability. I will disagree with you. I think I could see them replacing George with Carlos, but I think that replacement would have happened if Carlos had been willing to take the risk with the one year contract this coming year, because I think if he had, they would have given Kimmy one more year in F2 and then George and Carlos would have sort of battled it out to determine who gets to stay alongside Kimmy. So I agree that I think at this point, maybe they wouldn't replace George with Carlos, but I don't think George is safe at Mercedes personally. Um, And I think especially if Kimmy outperforms him next year like if we see a situation where Kimmy comes and hits the ground running um in the way that Franco Colapinto has I think there's a strong possibility that they replace George with someone else um if there's a better option on the table yeah I guess I just in my eyes I don't necessarily see Carlos as a better option like I see a better option being someone like Max Verstappen or Lando Norris or Oscar Piastri or Charles Leclerc, even though he's never going to leave Ferrari. Like to me, those would be like better options. And that's like, I guess I don't see Carlos as being necessarily an upgrade from George, but I don't disagree that George is definitely on the hot seat potentially for next year. Yeah, I see. I definitely know what you mean. I think like, I think the thing with Carlos is I, I would say side by side, I do think he's a better driver than George 
purely because I think he's a bit more consistent. And I also think he's in high pressure pressure situations more successful. So I think he he has less situations where he loses control of the car. He has less, less situations where he makes a move that it visibly shouldn't have been made and it does cause damage and problems. I think my thing with George is that he... I think lacks a little bit of stability that I always wonder if he had had one more year at Williams, maybe he could have been a little bit stronger of a driver at Mercedes. I think they were pretty quick to want to move Valtteri out of that seat. I don't know. Uh, That's so much like could be, woulda, shoulda, coulda, all these different things. But I do agree with you that I think it's not necessarily enough of an upgrade for them to consider swapping George and Carlos at that point. Um, I think it's to me it it would be an upgrade but i think also carlos has very specific wants out of his contract for a formula 1 uh situated seat and we saw that be the detriment of his ability to stay in the top of the grid for next year anyway so i think the problem would be the fact that there's there's no way that he would get what he wanted because they weren't willing to give it to him here ferrari wasn't willing to give it to him red bull doesn't really necessarily need him and mclaren's certainly not changing their driver lineup should anything happen and if it does i think again it's another opportunity of there's someone else out there that's already a part of their driver academy i'm thinking of Pato award that gives a better option oh, I, you were thinking of Pato. i was i'm always thinking of Pato. i was thinking of bordoletto because <laughs> he's yeah. winning up too right now but so i guess obviously that's the point like mclaren has a you know a good depth and and bench that they could have done i think i i personally i think about Pato because i'm just i still feel upset about the fact that he doesn't have his he was denied his place that he could have had and been on the formula one grid and he would have been a part of the red bull camp at that point had the fia not um, decided to have some fun with the super license points but that's neither here nor there and also um pato was there this weekend did hot laps for people and uh he is doing his fp1 session in mexico city next week so i think i think this is a total side tangent but i really think pato could bring quite a bit to the table when it comes to formula one in um maintaining that you know, Mexico, um, fan, that Mexican fan base, um, making this Mexico city race an even bigger deal. I can't imagine what it would be like if there were two Mexican drivers on the, on the grid and especially one with a fan base that is as large and as dedicated as Pato's is. Um, I just think he, and I also just think he's such an incredible driver. I really think he would, he would perform well in formula one. And they're just, again, it's another, there's no place for him just like there's no place for franco there's no place for anyone that i care about um it's fine <laughs> so i also would love to see pato on the grid because i love him in indycar and i also think he'd be a great addition but that was just not since we were talking about all of the young talent in f2 that was just wasn't who came to mind initially when we were talking about mclaren yeah, I think um, I think the problem that Carlos is going to have trying to get back to the top of the grid is despite the fact that he's an incredible driver and we've seen really good stuff from him even just this week was a, a great performance for him both in the sprint and the race itself. He's going to be up against the idea of young talent. And I think that's a problem that a lot of these drivers are going to have as we kind of cycle through. But next year we have four rookies coming on and three of them have already gotten to prove what they can do on, on the track. So you've got Kimmy coming in for Mercedes. You have Ollie coming in for Haas. You have Jack coming in for Jack Duan coming in for Alpine. And you have most likely Liam Lawson coming in for V carb. If he continues to perform the way he is, I can't see that they don't bring him in. So that's four rookies on the grid. Then this year, you've also been able to see what Franco Colapinto can do. And that's so that's five, you know, young talents that we've seen come up and really prove themselves to be exciting. Kimmy is really the only one who hasn't had a chance to properly prove himself because he's had one free practice session that he crashed in. But we've seen great lap times. I do think we'll see him potentially come in and perform very well and surprise a lot of people. And that being said, I think people are really starting to look at the fact that even just in the conversation we were having about who could come up for McLaren should something happen, there were two drivers that we were completely separately thinking of that were very promising young drivers. And I think the problem that Carlos is going to have and that a number of other drivers are going to have is getting back up to that top seat is going to be a competition, not only with the people that you're used to competing with, but this entire new generation of drivers that have been waiting for a long time. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. I'm glad that we're seeing a bit of the changing of the guard because I feel like F1 seemed to be in a bit of a rut where they were just keeping on 
drivers for the sake of consistency, but I don't think that that is the way that you move forward. And we needed to like restart this influx of young talent into the sport and hopefully getting so many impressive rookies in next season will make teams less wary to continue to bring in like one or two rookies each year, kind of just like as things continue to evolve. Yeah. And I think we're, I think hopefully this is the sort of dam that breaks that, right? Like, or this is sort of the the year that breaks that dam is the correct (laughs) application of that word. (laughs) But I think it could be, it could be a real big shift. And I think it, it will mean that we'll see some drivers like we're seeing now, like a Daniel Ricardo or a Logan Sargent. We're going to start to see people who people like. And I know someone's going to say something about me l- lumping the two of them in together as they're very different situations. But I think as we see more young talent come in, the people who are going to have to make way is going to be a little frustrating too. I think you're going to see a number of drivers that people are used to having have to start to leave. Yeah, but that's, as we said, F1 is a business. So it is. While I will be sad, I am also looking forward to getting the young rookie talent on the grid because they all completely deserve it and deserve to be there just as much, if not more than several of the current drivers on the grid. Absolutely. Well, one thing I do want to talk about, we sort of talked about, normally we talk about the race in chronological order, but I think this was kind of fun. I enjoyed talking about the way that we went through everything. We've already talked about talked about the lockup. We've talked about Lewis being out of the la- out of the race in lap three, which is just I have to repeat it because I still can't believe it had happened. Um, But the other thing that we actually have just jumped right past that we didn't talk about was the start, which was, I I know you watched a couple of minutes after, like we were sort of on a delay and I was waiting for you to to see it. (laughs) The start, I was like screaming, like in my living room. I thank God it was noon and not like 6 a.m. like it usually is. (laughs) But I was like, oh my God, oh my God. (laughs) You've got Lando on pole he can't hold that position and this big defensive move from max pulling him far out um opens it up for just for Charles to just breeze on by he was like oh thanks i'll take that i'll take that (laughs) front leaning position were you screaming were you losing it (laughs) yeah so i was over watching the race at my parents house with my dad and we were both like screaming at the tv he was like we were both screaming at like the Lando, like Max situation. And then he, we saw the Ferrari go through and he was like, Oh my gosh, Carlos went through. I was like, no, it was Charles. <laughs> like we had like, a, I was like, no, it was Charles. Like we had like a whole like moment, but both of us were like freaking out at the start being like, this is absolute chaos. And I did text <laughs> you before the race saying like, I don't know why, but I just have a bad feeling that like turn one is going to be absolute mayhem. And it wasn't the mayhem that I expected, but it was the best case scenario <laughs> because it set up Charles for an incredible race. Oh, uh, I was so happy for him. And also I am like so happy about the Ferrari evolution that we've had this year that this has been for a year that started out with everyone certain that it was just another year of fighting for second behind Red Bull and Max. This has been one of the most exciting seasons of Formula One that we've had in a bit. And it's so funny because I want to remind people that this season was expected to be so uncompetitive that the CEO of Formula E made a bet saying that if any driver other than Max can win, he would give a large donation to a charity of their choice. Like this was a completely unprompted clear marketing move to get you to watch formula E, but like we, it wasn't just formula E. We saw a number of motorsports series talking about how they're so much better to watch because it's competitive. That was this big line this year. And that has completely shifted. And we are now at the point where it's possible that Ferrari could win the constructors championship. And the only championship that is not really like in contention is driver's championship. And that's because of how much of a, a gap Max was able to build at the beginning of the season. But this is a situation where we have a three-way title fight for constructors that no one would have ever expected to happen. I have to say, I do not think that Charles technically is mathematically eliminated from winning the driver's championship championship it would be an insane (laughs) long shot but I do not think that as of yet he is technically mathematically eliminated he did address that in the post-race press conference which like someone did ask they were like so like do you guys think you can win the constructors and also Charles what do you think like do you think you could be you could be the (laughs) world champion and his answer was I mean you know never say never which is fair like technically mathematically he could still win but it would be 
it would be a deeply, deep long shot, which he said the way he phrased it was if we did everything right uh, from now until the end of the season, I think constructors is, you know, well within reach. If we did everything right from now until the end of the season for the driver's championship, we would also still need luck and you can't rely on luck. So I think um, it's a fair point. Technically, anything could happen and never say never yeah so now we are in a situation where they are ferrari is eight points away from taking overtaking uh red bull and only 40 points away from mclaren so we're in a real situation where they could win the constructor's title yeah i brought up charles not being mathematically eliminated more because that is just like the delusional charles fan in me thinking like well there's still a chance but i think realistically what would have to happen would be max and lando taking each other out for the next five races is that what we have left yeah I have to admit that while they did look good on Friday I was like this is too good to be true I've been burned one too many times as a Ferrari fan (laughs) like I'm not getting my hopes up and as the weekend progressed I'm like oh no okay like this might actually be it and it seems like they're finally at like a knock on wood good place with their car that I think should help to carry them through the rest of the season so there's really no saying what could happen especially with that constructors championship yeah and the next few races are good tracks for them and then also we have Vegas coming up which they had a a fun time at last year so it'll be interesting to see Yeah, they were super strong at Vegas out of nowhere. So that definitely is one that could very much be on the cards for another like one, two with like what we saw today. And I do just have to say, when I say that I think anything can happen in the constructors, I would like to clarify that I think that it is almost certain that they are going to overtake Red Bull and at least get second in the constructors. I think that that is pretty at this point because you have two drivers performing at a top level at Ferrari where you only have one doing that at Red Bull. So I think that Red Bull is basically has to be consigning themselves to third at this point. The thing is, I I definitely agree with you. I think there's like very little chance that they do not overtake Red Bull and take second. And it is bonkers to me that Red Bull is okay with that. I mean, I don't know that they're okay with it, obviously, but I also don't know they've had chances to change that and they have not done so. And so I am quite curious to see what happens at Mexico City because that is also the highest pressure race for Checo. It is a home race for him. Last year he had the worst possible turn of events for himself. <laughs> um and he just has not been performing the way that he needs to be performing. And it, unfortunately like you can't there's two championships. One's a team championship and one's an individual championship. And Max cannot win a constructor's championship on his own in this field. And I think when you're looking at something like Carlos and and Charles both driving at the best of their capabilities, the car is firing on all cylinders. Um, you're looking at the way that McLaren has been over, able to overtake them for the same reasons. I, I really struggle to see how Red Bull maintains second and certainly not how they take first. Yeah, I think... First is long gone. It's now just a matter of if Ferrari has enough to catch McLaren as well. And I think that's something only time will tell because McLaren did not seem to be happy with the car this weekend, but who knows if that will change going forward. But that's part of why I hesitate about like whether Checo is actually going to be in that seat next year, because as much as Red Bull can say they have a contract, we know that those contracts don't necessarily mean anything. And I know Checo brings in a lot of money, but I don't think he brings in enough to cover the difference between first and third in a constructors championship, which seemed to be like the point people were making is like, oh, Checo brings in enough to cover whatever the difference is between first and second. Fine. But if they're going to keep dropping down that order, that's where I think it really starts to become a more significant issue. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think like also, that's also one of the things that I think is interesting about some of these younger drivers that can come in is how much money they can bring with them as well. And like the unfortunate truth is that like the Liam and Danny situation is the same thing that's happening with Checo right now. Like it is a way of how much money you bring to the team versus how much money you're losing the team by by falling down and and not being able to make it through. And so when you look at someone like a Franco who brought all of this money with him for from other Argentinian companies that were interested in in becoming sponsors and now have have made long-term deals with Williams and that has been a really big benefit for them. You also are looking at the same thing for for Checo like how long does the sponsorship money and the fan money and the fan desire to have him on the grid and how how long does it take before that is no longer the balance and 
how far are they going to let themselves fall until that's the case? Yeah. And I understand them not wanting to rock the boat before Mexico. And that might be why they're giving him until the end of the season. But the fact that he got beat by George Russell, who started from the pit lane, not a great sign for his future, unfortunately. In fact, a very bad sign, I think. I I fear. Yeah, I, I... I don't know. It's it's hard to speculate just because, quite frankly, like I was surprised by the fact that we didn't see a change earlier. And so now that we haven't, it's hard to say like that they're going to make a change. But like you said, even though he has a contract, every contract has an exit clause. So, But especially at Red Bull, we know all of those contracts have exit clauses because exactly. they are not afraid to switch people around get rid of them left and right yeah so that's what i i think um i think that's the trouble is we're literally watching red bull just fall and fall and fall and i i do think the question of who is max's teammate long term really becomes a question of the fact that you if you continue to have a a competitive field like this and people continue to catch up and also they don't have adrian newey they are losing other members of their team that are very important they have too much of a gap to make up that if you don't have a good second driver as well. That that really is just going to continue to be the case. So it's a, it's a real big question, I think. A big question mark for Checo's future. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out. Yeah. Well, after that, it, it pretty much is, if we talk about Charles a little bit, I think what a great drive. He really has found a way to, I think he mentioned this actually in his post-race press conference, but I think that change with his race engineer has made all the difference. They seem to communicate significantly better than previous previous matchups, as one might say. And one of the things that Charles said in the post-race press conference about his race engineer is that even though he's quite young for the position, he manages emotions very well or emotional situations very well. And that seems to be a big difference for the way things are, are moving forward. And I think I noticed that in in their conversation this race like you had clear communication of do you want to do this do you want to do that has anything changed like everyone knew which plan it was there wasn't anything wild being thrown out um pitting happened when like you know there was a, a genuine conversation like a genuine back and forth of Charles saying like don't leave me out too long I don't want to be under pressure and race team like you know, working through and saying like, okay, come in now, working through the strategies. Everybody seemed to be on the same page. It was thrilling, (laughs) thrilling news. I think that it is great for him to have more of that support on the pit wall, because I think that Charles is and always has been an emotional driver, so to speak, in that you can tell when he's nervous and not that that affects his driving in any way, but I think that having somebody on the other side of the radio that is going to help him through those situations and help him manage it better than we had before is just something that he needs personally to like keep his like confidence up during the race, just because I think we've seen him falter in some of those high pressure situations. And the past in his career but he really seems to have come into like a really good consistent form minus him hitting the wall in practice in Baku but that's to be expected because we know that Charles and the walls in Baku are best friends so I don't (laughs) hold that against him (laughs) like he I just feel like this season he has really like it's almost like he's really figured out a way to like put it all together and it makes me really excited for what is to come for him and Ferrari, especially going into next year. Like I think that it is a big wild card, but also a potentially a huge opportunity for them. Agreed. Yeah, I think it's really next year. I'm really excited about Ferrari. I, I'm, as we all know, a very big Lewis Hamilton fan. I'm very excited to watch him and Charles work together. I, I'm really excited to see kind of like Fred's changes that he's been making. You can see a clear shift in Ferrari since he's taken over. And I think that clear shift really was highlighted this week by Benotto being asked whether or not he would have hired Lewis and point blank saying no, which I thought was a wild statement. His argument was was essentially you committed to to Charles, so that should be your plan. He should be your first driver. But that also implies that they had always made it clear that Carlos was not going to be ever prioritized, which I don't know that I would agree that he's been so deprioritized in that way that it was so shocking that they would bring on a, a Lewis Hamilton versus someone else. I also think it's wild 
to think that anyone would not want the money and prestige that comes with bringing Lewis Hamilton in, even if you don't think he's at the top of his game anymore. So I thought it was a wild statement, but I also thought it really clearly showed the difference between what Fred's doing and what was being done before he got there. I definitely think that we're starting to see like the fruits of Fred's labor. Like obviously he's comes in and it's not going to be immediate, but we're starting to see that consistency and not kind of like the almost like complacency with mediocrity that we saw mm. under Bonotto. I feel like things would happen and Bonotto and the team would kind of just be like, it is how it is. And bad things happen now under Fred. And he's like, yeah, no, we're going to change that so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, the prospect of not wanting to sign Lewis Hamilton is just absurd. And you're right. They have never said that, like, I mean, everybody kind of knows that Charles is like the priority, but they've been very honest about the fact that they don't develop the car in like one direction or another to suit one driver or the other. So yeah, like. Carlos was never officially the number two. And when, yeah, when Lewis Hamilton comes and says, Hey, I'm thinking of leaving Mercedes, you have to pick up that phone call. Yeah. It's like, Hey buddy, what would you like? Literally anything. You just let me know. Right. Um, (laughs) Which is how I imagine that conversation happening is that Lewis called up his old buddy, Fred, and was like, listen, Mercedes is not giving me what I want. And Fred's like, okay, what is it that you want? Like, (laughs) tell me and I'll get you a contract tomorrow. It's like, you just write down the deal points. You can even write the contract if you want. We'll put it on a, (laughs) put it on a napkin, whatever you like. Yeah. And I think I'm really excited because I think we're starting to see those changes and that's, you know, we're starting to see the shifts in the car. We're starting to see the changes in the culture. We're starting to see the changes in strategy. And I think complacency is the best word that you use to, to explain that. Like, I think you're so right about that. There is a complete shift on what is acceptable at Ferrari as there was previously and so I think we're finally starting to see that shift and I think it's going to kick into overdrive next year and then even after that with the 2026 regulation changes I think it's going to be a very exciting um, run for Ferrari and it's exciting to start to see it change and I I think they have a real shot at potentially winning constructors this year that's the that's the real wild situation that we're at props to Fred if there's one person the one person we can agree should have been hired it's Fred uh, so I think it'll be good. Oh, um, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Fred has done wonders for that team, and yeah, hearing the Italian national anthem and just like the secondhand joy that I get yeah. from like watching the team celebrate to the national anthem is yeah. just like it gets me every time. <laughs> Same. They are the most excited, and it's there's something about being a fan of Ferrari, or even if you're not a fan of Ferrari as Sebastian Vettel says everyone's a Ferrari fan but I think the thing about watching Ferrari win is that there is like just such a in their blood thrill of racing and desire to be the best at Formula One and it it is such a different energy than you get from any other team everyone's always happy to win obviously but I think Ferrari celebrates as though they have won a war every single time they win a race like it is a full intense excitement there are flags there is singing there is smiling there is crying like there is something just so infectious about it and so that's the other reason why I'm excited to see Lewis go there is that even today when you saw Lewis end his race on lap three and he gets out of the car, you can hear the fans on television chanting for Lewis at a loss, like <laughs> at a, we don't get to watch <laughs> anything more. And and he's spoken about this and said like, he was very surprised to realize that his fans would stick around when he wasn't winning. And I think he we've seen that over the last few years of just the level of dedication that Lewis's fans have. And so I think mixing this together with Ferrari's level of fan behavior, even on their own team. Like I think the people who work for Ferrari are fans of Ferrari and of their drivers in such an intense way that mixing that with Lewis Hamilton's fan base and the excitement of Lewis in general is just going to be, I think, infectious. I think it's going to be really hard not to be excited about. I'm glad you brought up the fan behavior of even the people that work for Ferrari (laughs) because the way that the camera caught one of the mechanics running from park ferme with like the number like the sign placard that goes up in front of the car it's like the fact that somebody without fail if they do well will 
steal those placards basically <laughs> like they're probably just sitting in like each mechanic probably has one sitting in their house yeah. like that is like peak fan behavior i mean like i'm gonna get my little souvenir like i'm gonna get charles's like number one like car placard yeah <laughs> up the track and like take it back to the factory <laughs> with me <laughs> It's like, there's got to be one hanging over everyone's bed. I love it. And also, um, they did catch, they caught uh, one of the team members kiss, like, there's like this very soft moment where there's just like a soft kiss pressed to Charles' ham- helmet when the, everyone's team, like, <laughs> congratulating him. I, I really think, like, we talk so much about, like, fangirls and women and young women, especially becoming big fans of Formula One and the sort of assumptions that are made about that and one of the assumptions I think is that a lot of a lot of young women who have come into the sport have become really big Ferrari fans and that has been sort of the home that a lot of the initial kind of wave of people coming over from the internet from the drive to survive boom and from this idea of like fangirls being allowed to be a part of this sport so much of those girls and those young women and those older women in general just women in in general have become Ferrari fans and really loud and proud Ferrari fans. And I've seen so much response to that being like, oh, it's because the drivers are hot or it's easy to be this or that, whatever. And then there's also always this like, oh, you're a Ferrari fan. Good luck. You're going to need it. It's a a heartbreaking, terrible, gut-wrenching thing to be a Ferrari fan. And I think what people don't realize is that like what it is about Ferrari is not that the drivers are hot or that there's, you know, again, I always bring up the fact that even if you get caught in by like a fan cam or something like that, or a picture is what makes you curious and you become a Formula One fan because you then go and watch. I still maintain that nobody gets up no matter how attractive someone they know is at four in the morning to watch a race where every single inch of that person is covered. No, no one gets up to do that just because of how attractive they are. But I think one of the things that has made Ferrari such a place for fangirls in particular. And when I say fangirls, I mean like the archetype, not just fans who are women. Yeah. The thing that has like made it such a welcoming space for them is the fact that there is a fan behavior in Ferrari's culture overall. Like you ride, you die, you bleed Ferrari. I want to say you bleed red, but so does everyone else. Uh, (laughs) You, (laughs) you are like the culture of Ferrari has so many things that that overlap with fandom behavior and with being a fan of of a television show or being a fan like I think there there's such a crossover of women who were fans of Supernatural growing up that become Ferrari fans now like this is exactly the same type of culture that comes from fandom and that is like no matter what these are my guys I don't care that it hurts that they consistently lose I want to feel on top of the world when something good happens to them and I will cry with them when something horrible happens to them and watching celebrations when they win is exactly the same feeling like it is a, a something that you want to be a part of and like you want to be in that circle you want to be the one the kind of giggly person that's like yeah I'm gonna steal the park for May sign and take it home with me and you're like that's what I would do that's what I would do like yeah. I <laughs> if I could do it I would do it I want to kiss Charles helmet I want to be a part of the little selfie like Charles taking a, a selfie with his team every time he wins something or running back on the podium and Monza to to say I'm so sorry I forgot to take a selfie with the fans like that is fangirl behavior and that that team really like opens that up and I think there's something so infectious about it and I also think that that's the thing that's bringing girls in and saying like oh Ferrari is going to be my team it's it's there's so many factors to it that are more than just like attractiveness of the drivers I think so much of it is that culture of of relating to the mechanic that steals the park for a sign because this is our win you know yeah I've always said that like I I can't tell you like how I ended up as a Ferrari fan Like there was just something about like, it's almost like a Ferrari chose me sort of thing. Not like (laughs) I chose Ferrari. And it was, it had nothing to do with the drivers because when I was becoming a fan through watching Drive to Survive, Charles was like 20 years old. And I'm like, I can't like, (laughs) like he was a child. Yeah, yeah. Like, can I admit that like Ferrari's drivers are attractive now? Yes. But when I was becoming a fan of the sport, I was like, this is a child. Like that was not like a thought that crossed my mind ever. And I think a lot of people also could probably 
relate to that. But there was yeah. just something about, I don't know, there was something about Ferrari that I finished that show. And I was like, when I had like deciding which team I was going to support, it just somehow ended up being Ferrari. And I could not tell you why. Like, there's just something about that team, and that culture and the sense of national pride that is just like so infectious. I agree. Yeah, I think I think it is just like, ironically, I think it's something that feels so welcoming. Like if you are com- if you're brand new to this sport, and you decide that you support Ferrari, any Ferrari fan that you see, you see someone in a Ferrari shirt there and you say like Forza Ferrari, it's done. You we're teammates, we're friends, <laughs> we're like forever. And I think that's something that not every team necessarily has. And it, it should feel that way, but Ferrari just has something a little special. And again, it's that same thing. Se- Sebastian Vettel's very famous quote, like you can't really put your finger on it. It's just something that feels right. Yeah. Well, I think we've pretty much covered all of the exciting parts of the race. The one thing that we haven't gotten to which is a big deal, uh, is the number of five second penalties that we had thrown out uh, and about on this this racetrack. Again, a thing that we mentioned at the top of the episode, a lot of this is because they repaved certain parts of the track. However, some of those penalties were pretty detrimental to race strategies and situations like that. And so we might as well talk about the biggest one in that final penalty which could I don't want to say it's the end of the championship battle but I do want to say that it's a pretty big blow to the championship battle this weekend we have this move where Lando is arguably forced off the track by Max they both go fully off the track and Lando comes back in in front of Max on track and generally speaking that is going to be a five second penalty if you do not hand the position back I think this is probably going to be one of the most contentious points of the race that everyone's going to be talking about for a bit and then ultimately in the end with the championship title wherever that ends up this is going to be a moment that comes up I don't know how you feel about this we kind of intentionally like didn't get into it without before we got onto our recording here but you have have this moment where Lando over the radio says, do you guys think I should hand it back? I'm paraphrasing, but essentially the question is like, am I going to get this penalty or not? Should I take it, hand it back? And at that point, he still has enough time to potentially repass. And they ultimately tell him not to and to keep defending and wait for the call. And by waiting for the call, they don't get the penalty until the final lap. So they don't have a chance to change anything. How, how do you, how do you feel? (laughs) I've gone back and forth on like the penalty aspect, because I think there's two aspects to this. I think there is the penalty and the fairness of the penalty. And then there is the reaction to the penalty. Mm. And I have gone back and forth. I had originally, the conclusion that I had settled on was that if Lando got a penalty for overtaking off the track, Max should have also gotten a penalty for forcing another driver off the track, as we saw so many other drivers get during this race and during the sprint race yesterday. Yeah. In that sense, they would wipe each other out and it just essentially wouldn't matter. Lando would get to keep the position. But then when you actually look at the regulations, part of the overtaking off track penalty requires that the other driver remain on track which Mm. Max didn't do. So that's where then I come back to is like, okay, well then maybe Lando shouldn't have got the penalty in the first place. So which either way, in either scenario, I think that Lando should have kept the spot or not having the penalty or have the penalty. Sure, sure. Penalties wipe each other out, whatever it may be. Based on what you're saying in terms of the actual legal written version of the regulations, it ultimately sounds like Max actually should have gotten a five second penalty for pushing Lando off the track. Lando should have been able to maintain position and there shouldn't have been a penalty, a five second penalty for um, overtaking off. Yeah, I think that at the very least, there shouldn't have been a five second penalty for overtaking off. Whether you're going to give Max a penalty too, I don't know. I don't really care because I think at that point, like it's a moot point. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's not a moot point. Yeah, he would have fallen. Oscar further. was within five seconds, so he would have fallen further. And then we have a huge, not huge swing, but a swing in points in the yep. driver's championship. So it comes down to the FIA being inconsistent, not following their own rules and regulations, but that is nothing new. The part that's frustrating to me is that McLaren didn't foresee this happening. My thing is they should know better because it's the FIA and it's not just the FIA in general, it's the FIA dealing with the situation with Max Verstappen. And we know that just from history, the FIA is more reluctant to one, give max penalties or, and two has a tendency to harshly, more harshly punish those that are involved in incidents with max when 
if a similar incident happened with other drivers, they would not do so. I think McLaren, even though they believed that they were in the right, should have had him give the position back foreseeing that this would have been a likely possibility. So it's that oversight of like, and not covering off this action from the FIA that I think was probably inevitable. And I think most fans knew that it was inevitable. And that was why we were all so frustrated when they were like, why are, when they were telling him not to give the position back. It's just because this was always going to happen. And so they could have done something about it and they could have saved that third place. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the biggest issue that I had was that, as you said, anticipating that this was a possibility the thing that was frustrating is it wasn't the middle of the race he didn't have time whatever decision they made was the decision that they made and so when you're weighing the fact that there's a possible penalty of five seconds coming if you don't do it and that there's a way to maintain that I felt the and again this is a, a I think something we keep coming into with McLaren where like all of us are saying well it, I would have done this or I would have done that obviously knowing that we don't have all the data we don't we don't do this as a job but I think the part that's frustrating about McLaren is that they've had so many moments where you're like well that's certainly not what a normal person would have done when when we're talking about how to call a, a situation and to me it makes more sense for them to anticipate the possibility of the five second penalty, whether they think they deserve it or they don't anticipate the fact that they could have it. Don't make it a conversation knowing that you have that little time left in the race, give the position back and give him time to retake it. And then in the time that you're trying to get him to retake that position, fight with the FIA about having a penalty for Max forcing Lando off the track. Because I think if you look at it that way, the current situation that we ended up having is that you have Lando actively not giving the position back, moving under braking, um, and you have Red Bull kind of forcefully saying to the stewards, get like he has to give the position back or, or, or a penalty and also moving under braking. And that's the conversation that they're having versus give the position back, remove the ability for Red Bull to be on the offense and then put them back on the defensive and say, like, where is this five second penalty? Here are all of the other drivers this race alone that have gotten the same penalty for the same thing that, that just happened. Um, then at that point, you've got Lando attempting to retake and potentially retake the position. And if he can't catch him, hopefully you win the five second penalty for forcing him off the track in the first place. Yeah, it seems like another one of those things where it's just or one of another one of those instances this season where McLaren doesn't seem like they've like showed up to like play the game and that's like the best way that I can like describe it because there's the straightforward strategy whatever but then there's like all of the strategy things on the back back end like you described and that's where I think McLaren repeatedly this season has just not been prepared for and I don't know if that's because they're out of championship form or that's just not how they want to operate but this was just I think a huge missed opportunity and as much as I like hate to say that I think that it, Lando's championship hopes are essentially done I think they kind of are I think this week had to be a, a net positive for him for it to still be a possibility and so I think unless something catastrophic happens to Red Bull for these last five races I think it's Max's I agree. And I think at a certain point, they're going to have to really start worrying about covering off Ferrari. Like I think, unfortunately, um, and this sort of takes us into wrapping it up and talking about predictions for the season, for the rest of the season, we're only at five races left. I think at a certain point, that focus is going to have to shift from beating Max in the um, driver's championship to holding Ferrari back for the constructor's championship, which is... Uh, going to be a more important battle because it'll be a closer one and i think once that becomes the case then you start talking about maximizing points for both drivers for making sure that they're you know um like if oscar is going to have the potential to have a, a stronger race than lando you're going to start to have a conversation about swapping drivers about maximum points for both of them and i think if that's the case then that really becomes a moment and it's it's a position they've put themselves in in the way that they went through doing this but they are going to have to at a certain point say okay we're giving up the championship battle and we're focusing on the constructors title and i think that kind of sucks i think there are a number of moments that at the end of the season if we go back and do a full post-mortem on everything that went wrong for lando this season there are a number of moments that come down to bad calls from McLaren and that come down to calls of not making a decision to fight for that championship early on, of maybe not believing that he had the ability to do it or that they could do it. I think there are so many moments where this championship battle may have been lost, and I won't say that it's completely over. I think they will still try to fight for at least a couple more races before they have to shift their focus, but I do think 
there are a number of moments where this race was lost. I mean, this championship battle, if Lando loses it, they were pretty intentional and problematic points in the strategy um, and the decisions that they've made. And this is just kind of another moment piling on on top of all of them. Yeah, I think next weekend in Mexico will probably be like a huge deciding factor because if it's a weekend that somehow goes terribly for Red Bull, then maybe they keep fighting. But if they still aren't quite coming to grips with their car and Ferrari is still strong, then I think after next weekend, they have to decide to switch gears because it just seems Ferrari seems almost like inevitable at this point with how they've come back from the summer break, like on full throttle. I think also like a point that you made earlier is not just about how much more equitable these cars in the top range have made themselves where you have Ferrari, Red Bull, sometimes Mercedes and McLaren all competitive at the top and and having these strong cars. I think the other thing that's happened is we have other cars that are typically not even a point of contention or, or a concern for these drivers that are also competing much better. So you have Haas making it into Q3 in these sprint races both cars making it into Q3 and then scoring like having the highest finish they've ever had in a sprint or a um, Grand Prix itself and then you have a Williams consistently trying to kind of push his way up with Franco you have Franco making it all the way to Q3 these are positions that are being taken away from from these top drivers and there's now a lot more comp- competition across the field where there's a situation where um franco might be a problem for knocking someone out that typically would be qualifying in q3 consistently and i think there there are these moments now where it's like okay if you have this much competition all the way down the field which is great for racing there's also much more competition that could be could be something that goes wrong for you at that top kind of championship battle and so i think they just unfortunately waited way too long to make these decisions and they had the car and they had the driver and they didn't have the strategy yeah and i think in going off of what you were saying like i think we saw a perfect example of this with oscar in the sprint race he just got caught out and there were plenty of midfield cars in between him and like that top tier but it's not Mm -hmm. a given that you can just fly through the midfield like it kind of used to be and we've seen yeah. that, I mean, I guess time and time again with Checo too. I think George today was a clear exception because he really made moves, but I think that was also partially strategy. So if you, yeah, if you slip up, you might be just cracking the points because that might be all you can do. Cause we've seen like Franco, for example, defend his heart out against top, top drivers and make things stick. And it's really just a complete wild card even with the midfield teams involved and it's unfortunate that it's gone this way for Lando and McLaren but it's how the cookie crumbles (laughs) I don't know what else to say (laughs) I don't know why that was the funniest possible ending to your like very thoughtful strategic conversation that's just, I just like couldn't think just of how the cookie crumbles. That's, what came, that's what came out I don't know why Oh, man. Uh, The championship cookie crumbles for Lando Norris. How unfortunate. (laughs) (laughs) That should be the title of the episode right there. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's my question for you, Lindsay. We have been talking for a significant amount of time about a very exciting race. Do you have, I think we've kind of touched on it, but any strong predictions for next week or the rest of the season? I think that Ferrari is going to be a problem. And I don't just say that as a delusional Ferrari fan I think that they've showed that they can be a problem I think a one two in Vegas is something that would be incredible I think that yeah they're just a team to look out for I don't have any like specific predictions but I think just as far as the general trajectory of things that's kind of what I foresee being like who I foresee being the strongest as we head into these last five races. I agree with you. I think, I think anything can happen in Vegas. Personally, Vegas was such a surprising race last season that I think we could have another very exciting and fun situation there. So my eyes will definitely be there. And I think that my bold prediction is that I think Ferrari is going to be a real contention for the constructors championship. And I think that there are going to be a lot of moments that McLaren is going to regret about decisions they made earlier on this season. And I'm curious to see what that means for the future with Lando, Oscar, and McLaren, and if they they all stay together, if they keep the band together for the kids, so to speak. I think uh, I think that's my, those are, it's again, like a, a loose prediction. I think 
we'll see how things go in Mexico City. But uh, overall, I don't know. I feel like we are going to have a very exciting end of the season. And I think a lot of that's going to come down to the Ferrari McLaren constructors battle. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, even if we're not going to necessarily have like a viable championship fight in terms of the driver's championship, Mm -hmm. it's that doesn't mean that these races are going to be any less important or any less exciting because everybody is just so close especially now that Red Bull came back from that summer or that fall break on top of their car a little bit more it's just I love that we are getting close racing same I'm a huge fan so I think um (laughs) I think it's just I don't know I think it's just been great racing this for these past few weeks and I think it's going to be great racing for the rest of the season so that is my optimistic prediction the races are going to be fun to watch that's my (laughs) hot take (laughs) Yeah, you have one. Well, Lindsay, this has been so much fun. Thank you for hanging out with me for an extraordinary amount of time to talk about uh, cars going fast in a circle. It's always my favorite uh, favorite pastime. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I know, yeah, we said before we recorded that hopefully this wouldn't go as long as our last one after Hungary, but we, I think we got just as crazy of a race this time around. So Here's we did thing. not necessarily meet our goal of having a shorter podcast (laughs) you know what Lindsay? that's just the way the cookie crumbles (laughs) (laughs) always if you don't want to watch these races alone you can join the actual grid chat i host a group chat of motorsports fans where fan behavior is encouraged and there's no such thing as a stupid question we watch these races live together chat about breaking news and of course send each other an unhealthy amount of memes if you'd like to join the grid chat you can do so at tandemproductions.com slash grid chat there will also be a link to that in the episode description once you fill out the form on the webpage there you'll get an invite via email from me if you want to connect let me know what you thought about the episode or even just ask me another question that you'd like me to cover on the show you can find me on all social media platforms at marissa kamari and one of the best ways to connect with me is if you're listening to this podcast on herd fm you can find me in the community section on herd fm where my username is just my first name marissa and once we follow each other after every episode that you listen to i'll be able to comment and have a conversation with you directly so again my username on herd fm is marissa as always i've been your host marissa tandon and thank you for joining the grid chat